Hi, this is Michael P. Coleman, Content Director for Brother Be Well, thanking you for checking out this series, this trauma and healing series brought to you by Blue Shield of California's Blue Sky Initiative. We talked about at the beginning um, the the old definition of trauma that it used to always be used to talk about a physical trauma. Um, I'm happy to say that we as a society are becoming much more trauma aware, if you will, than we've ever been. I'm wondering from your perspective as a marriage and family therapist, why is it so important that we remain, that we become if we're not, and we remain trauma aware? And specifically, I, I'm reading a book. The, the name of the book is what happened to you? And the premise of the entire book is we need to make a shift from asking someone that, that's struggling or having some issues. The old question used to be, what's wrong with you? And we, we're shifting now to what happened to you? What in your background causes has caused this reaction or this experience or you to, to, uh, to behave in, in a certain way? Why is it so important that we shift that question? And why is it so important that we as a society become trauma aware? There's several reasons, Michael, and the first one starts right here, right? So the first one starts with us, you know, and I, and I use the analogy all the time about seeing our bodies as a high performance Ferrari, right? Or, or you know, a Lamborghini or a Maserati and, and the symptoms we experience physically, you know, through trauma and mentally as a metaphor for a dashboard that's letting us know something's wrong. So all those symptoms I've, I've already talked about is, is the dashboard, those lights going off, you know, the codependency, you know, the enmeshment, those are those lights going off telling you there's something going on with that Ferrari. And being trauma aware really equates to people of color um, having a lower mortality, mortality rate, really. I mean, when it comes down to it, because if we have the skills to recognize this is trauma aware now. So we're being aware of what trauma is, how it occurs, what it looks like, um, how to get treatment for it and where to go for treatment. That's going to uh, help the mortality rate within people of color. And we've been traumatized by an event, and we've also recognized how it impaired our functioning in some kind of way, right? And and where do we go? And and how do we, you know, what do we do once we find out? So there's all these steps that uh, will really require us to be trauma aware. You know, um, what does trauma do to us? You know, how, how does it impact my, you know, my pre-existing conditions? I already have hypertension or blood pressure, or now I've been affected with COVID, and now. You know, uh, maybe my lungs aren't operating at the fullest capacity they did before. You know, how does, you know, being trauma aware, you know, impact my body physically, you know, this different body that I have over the last two years. So there's several different determinants that we have to consider. And for the second part, like with, what's wrong with you? Um, I look at it, what's wrong with you versus what happened to you. You know, what it really, it really, what it really is just learning how to address the person dealing with trauma from a humanistic component, right? So what's wrong with you furthers the issue why mental health stigma is prevalent in our communities. Because saying what's wrong with you is like, what's wrong with you? It's like you're judging them, right? What's wrong with you? So stigma is really rooted in people already thinking there's something wrong with them. So uh, destigmatizing mental health in the community really starts with changing our language as peers, professionals and friends. So at the very root of it, it's starting to change that language, like you said, you know, not using what's wrong with you, you know, but, you know, uh, how can I, can I, how can I help you? Or, you know, what's going on with um, the, the symptom that you're experiencing or what happened to you? What happened to you allows that person to tell their story. It allows them to share, you know, what's going on with them. And it gives you at least that avenue and that door to help them out. I'm taking some notes here, Christian, and so I'm going to use your words. Your, your words as always are so much better than mine. I was, I was thinking about this question earlier what's 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 wrong with you kind of puts the focus on the person it's clearly it's on their plate this is your problem and you are creating the problem what happened to you kind of lets the person it just by framing the question that way i think it, it suggests that there are external forces that we have nothing to do with we're going to talk a little bit about generational trauma here at brother be well people of color have have trauma that goes back centuries and we don't have any we had nothing to do with that right but we wind up today with these conditions and issues that are related to what happened to us not who we are or anything that we've done and that's really a uh, therapeutic technique is uh, depersonalizing depersonalization mm -hmm. so one thing of you know engaging youth you know that uh, as a therapist and a clinician what you do is you want to depersonalize so instead of saying you know um, how did that depression 
you know, affect you, you want to reword it saying, how would a person who went through this have dealt with this depression? So it depersonalizes it so they don't feel like the light is on them, right? They're yeah. talking about themselves. So it's it's also a therapeutic technique to use. I love that. I love that. Maybe, yeah, I love it. Thank you. Really appreciate it, Christian. Let's talk about, and you've touched on some of them, but let's get into the specific measurable mental and physical health impacts of trauma. And we're going to talk about them in detail during subsequent um, conversations during this trauma and healing series. But for, for this conversation, if you can summarize, how might one know if he or she is suffering from untreated trauma? Often we don't, we might not realize when I, when I took the ACEs test, I didn't, I had no idea that some of those experiences might be uh, driving certain behaviors or impacting my health. So how might one know if he or she is suffering from untreated trauma? Well, first, this goes back to your, your previous, right? The, the trauma aware. So that first step, right? We're looking at um, the ability to become trauma aware. So understanding, first of all, what it is. And then uh, as, you be, as the community, and as we become more trauma aware, we can look and see, you know, that there, the, the, within trauma, there's physical there's emotional, there's circumstantial, there's environmental, there's biological, um, there's uh, social, you know, so and there's, uh, there's, there's all these components that, that uh, play a part. So once we kind of know how that affects those different areas, we can, we can start to look out in those areas. So um, the first question you may ask is, do you experience emotional distress after being exposed to specific places, events? And check this out, smells. So uh, research and studies show that smells, you know, uh, can trigger someone's traumatic response. So they may, uh, as they were a child, maybe uh, they uh, may have been abused uh, physically and the smell of uh, the, the, the man or the woman's uh, clothes or, the, or the detergent that they had on or the, um, the, their, their body odor, you know, uh, triggers a certain um, response. So your body is so aware, your body is constantly working. Um, do you experience a, a regular uh, current nightmares or flashback or do you react physically after being exposed to something? That's another um, another indicator. Also, are you hypervigilant? So, you know, hypervigilance is always worried someone's going to, you know, uh, going to abuse you again or attack you in some way. You know, someone taps you on the shoulder and you, you, and you jump. It's called a startle response. So that's another symptom. You know, someone's trying to give you a hug and you're constantly always pulling away. Um, startle responses are, are very common um, too. And uh, when someone is jumpy after someone attempts to touch you, that's a really indication that maybe some type of tra uh, trauma has occurred. And these are also things that teachers use too, and uh, therapists use. You know, when they uh, when, when students are coming in the classroom and you know um, they're trying to assess or for uh, assess for child abuse or uh, as, as as they are a mandated child abuse reporter, if they notice some of these things, um, they also take note of these as well. Um, trauma also um, impacts your concentration, so as well as it causes irritability. So if you notice that, man, I'm just having, a, I'm getting enough sleep, and you know, I'm relaxing, I'm eating right, and I just, I can't focus or I can't concentrate. So these are some of the cognitive things that may occur. You know, and also isolation. So you may notice that you're subconsciously isolating from yourself or other people. You know, you don't want to be around other people or your friends. Um, you don't want to engage in doing the things that you like that you normally do. 
And the most important thing to consider is how persistent it has been. So this will help your clinician. This will help your doctor be able to like help diagnose it or, and treat you. You know, because they want to know how persistent has it been? How often does it occur? Um, how's it how's it impacting your daily functioning? You know, for with work and school and taking care of your family. And how long have you been experiencing the symptoms? So these are some of the things you really want to kind of just pay attention to. So when you do reach out for help from a professional, you can share this share this information with them. I'm uh, taking notes again, Christian. You just you made me think of someone that I know for for quite a number of years. We we've noticed uh, she completely freezes up whenever you get try to get too close. You can't hug her. You can't touch her shoulder, and she jumps. And I just wonder now, just based on what you said, if that you know, I just really want to ask that woman, what happened to you? What happened to you? Would be a great question that I hope someone's asking her. I, I appreciate you walking us through that, Christian. Let's talk about, you, you mentioned flashbacks, and that relates to this next question. For a while, repressed memories were very popular in movies and TV shows. I don't know if you remember them. Pop culture overall was seemed to be fascinated by that. I'm wondering if they have a basis in fact, and especially based on some of what we're talking about. Can someone suffer from a traumatic event, or maybe multiple traumatic events even, that one doesn't even explicitly remember? Michael, this this... A uh, question here really will put, shed light on how powerful our brains are, and how 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 much of a, uh, of a automated computer it really is, you know whether we're you know we're um, using it appropriately or not. So the the short answer is absolutely. You know, just because one doesn't remember a traumatic event doesn't mean that it didn't occur or they aren't suffering from it. And basically, how the brain works is it it literally tries to stay healthy by blocking out or flooding undesirable events. So um, so a technical clinical word is called flooding, something that the brain does. So basically um, for individuals uh, with ADHD, for example, uh, the prefrontal cortex of the brain, if they have experienced too much overstimulation, whether they're angry for a long time or they're sad for a long time or emotional or even um, um, under the influence, those same uh, components in the brain trigger a, a flooding event kicks in where you can't think, you can't remember. Um, it's a, it's a, it's, it's literally doing that. Your brain is flooded. So uh, it's almost similar to an old school car, right? Where you, you pump the gas several times and, you know, you're trying to start it. It's not going to start because there's too much gas, you know, in the, in the gas lines, it's flooded over. You have to wait for it to calm down. Same thing with the brain. Um, that's why memory loss could be a symptom of trauma too. So because that the brain, that's the brain's way of trying to cope or forget about it. Um, good example here. Uh, several times I've had uh, clients. You know, um, one of the one of the ways to assess um, trauma is, especially for uh, adolescent between you know um, maybe four years old to ten or twelve, even like fifteen years old. Uh, you'll sit them down and say, "So, tell me about um, your uh, your birthday at nine years old." If you know the trauma happened around maybe uh, ten or eleven, uh, sometimes they'll say they don't remember their birthday, and you'll go out. Tell me your birthday at, at 10 or 11. And they have no recollection of their of their birthday or their first birthday. So um, that is a way that the body has basically either blocked or flooded the brain or that memory uh, of, that, of that memory portion of their brain, which is also an indication of trauma. Our bodies and brains are amazing, aren't, aren't they, Christian? That, that they're those protection mechanisms that are set up to help us get through uh, a situation or situations um, but again, so if, if, if left untreated, they can set up other problems that we're going to talk about during this trauma and healing series. Really appreciate you walking us through all of that, uh, Chris.
I'm, I'm curious about uh, how long the effects of trauma can last. How, how long can those conditions or symptoms that we've been talking about, how long will they stick around if, 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 if not, if they're left untreated? You know, it's, it's, this is another variable that, that occurs, right? So um, a lot of times we miss the, especially in youth and adolescence, and uh, we, we miss the mark in terms of, as a caregiver to see some of the symptoms. Um, so some of the symptoms, you know, that come that come early, they, that will kind of give us an indicator, which is uh, enuresis, was which is when a child uh, urinates on themselves or in bed, or they call it peeing in the bed, or in caprices where they defecate on themselves. And these are the clinical terms: enuresis, in caprices. These are also signs of trauma. So when um, sometimes you'll see a 14-year-old who's, you know, who's uh, peeing in the bed, you know, um, a lot of times that can be an indication of trauma. It's not a determination of trauma. But it could be an indication of it. So, it, it, so um, to answer your question, it really depends on the individual and the severity and how early those symptoms were picked up. And if they're in treatment, you know, the effectiveness of treatment and how long they have uh, been in treatment for, um, it can really uh, change change that time frame. So it can last for anywhere from six months to several years. And it could also uh, become intermittent, as we talked about earlier, right? And chronic, so where it goes away and then it comes back uh, via a flashback and dreams or so on. So you may have um, totally not ha you, you may not have any experiences or symptoms, and then maybe you go to that birthday party and you smell. You know, after 25 years of being in that room, you go back to that childhood home or your, your uncle, or your aunt's home. You have that smell of, the, of that bedroom or maybe the animal, and then those things come back. So it's really it really depends on the individual individual and severity, uh, which is really hard to detect. Uh, but it really does not matter on uh, what's going on in between those times, whether they're receiving treatment and how effective that treatment is. That's very important, too. How can we begin to heal from those traumatic experiences? <laughs> Well, first thing is first is it comes back to ourselves, right? Um, first thing we have to forgive ourselves. You know, we have to forgive ourselves for what occurred and accept that it wasn't our fault. Uh, a lot of times that some of these tra traumatic events happened when we were two, three, four, five, you know, up to 10 years old, and we had no control. It was maybe a older person um, who took advantage of our, our youth and our, you know, our, our uh, being naive. A lot of times, maybe we did have um, a, a control of the situation, but at the end of the day, we want to tell ourselves that you know um, that it wasn't our fault, and that's going to help with the stigma and shame, uh, which can prolong your um, your uh, recovery period. Many traumas that we've also experienced happened in our childhood, you know, so um, really have to really figure out, wrap our brains around what occurred. Sometimes we don't remember what occurred, you know, so we have to really wrap our brains around, you know, even though I can't remember. You know, um, how do I treat this um, this this condition? But next is really seeking that profession, uh, professional person, you know, a therapist or someone uh, who knows about trauma, not just any therapist. This is a, another misconception just to get any kind of therapist. You know, you really want to look for someone who's culture, a culturally competent therapist who provides trauma informed care. So trauma informed care is basically a therapist who takes into account uh, the totality, like right everything we talked about, the mind, body. Um, the, the social determinants, you know, where they're from, the environment, and have a good idea of that, and how trauma impacts that person, which is either physically, you know, socially, or emotionally, or biologically. So that's really the main thing is really finding a, a culturally competent therapist who knows, you know, um, what what they're talking about, and they they're specializing in in that in those areas of trauma. Uh, some of the interventions once you do find that person, once you do find a therapist, you want to ask them, you want to start you know, um, inquiring what type of training and certifications they had. And EMDR is a very, um, very effective uh, modality or intervention that, um, that really works with, with um, PTSD and any trauma-related um, uh, trauma related care. Also, uh, trauma-focused CBTs, so trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, and also mindfulness has been proven to be very effective uh, for when, when treating trauma. And also, Here's something else that's really cultural competent, right? So in the in the in the community, you know, and especially the communities of color, um, we may shy away from medication. 
we may shy away from, you know, talking about the issue with other people or actually being in a group around other people and sharing and being vulnerable, raw and open. So really being open to other forms of treatment, such as, you know, um, speaking to your primary doctor about or psychiatrist about, is there any medication that could help me, you know, through this, which there are medications that are used to treat, um, uh, to help treat, you know, PTSD and things that has, have to do with trauma, to kind of calm the brain down a little bit. Also support groups have been proven to be effective. And uh, lastly, you know, it's really, really about being selfish and, you know, doing that self-care and taking care of yourself so you're not so hard on yourself because most of the time people are just really hard on themselves. So those are just some things that you can start off with when you're looking to treat uh, trauma and, and anything trauma related. I think, Kristen, I, I, uh, you mentioned uh, being open to other types of care. And then you mentioned uh, just before that, I think EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, I believe it is. Uh, yeah. You and I, if, if memory serves, we may have done an, uh, a fairly early during the Brother Rewell journey, a whole separate session yeah. on EMDR. And I personally can remember a time in my life where I was I was open to anything and I have been through EMDR. So I always told myself whenever it comes up, I'm going to be very clear and transparent about that. So I can personally vouch for EMDR if you if you're suffering from trauma and extreme uh, PTSD, which I was. Um, check out EMDR, do a little research on that and everything that you mentioned, Kristen. Can't thank you enough for all of that information. Really appreciate it. As I said, we're going to be talking a little bit later, Kristen. I want to thank you, Kristen Jacobs, marriage and family therapist and Brother Be Well clinical advisor. You're going to be my partner for this whole series, Kristen. We're going to be talking about many of the different things that we touched on today, different ways of, of healing from, from traumatic experiences. So, so don't get too comfortable. Have a great rest of your day, but, but get ready. We'll be talking again. Really appreciate your help and your contributions to this platform. I'll be back. I'm, I'll be ready to roll. Really appreciate it, Christian. Always good to see you. Um, also want to thank our sponsor for this trauma and healing series, Blue Shield of California's Blue Sky Initiative. That's Blue Shield of California's Blue Sky Initiative. You can check out their website. It's blue, she, blue excuse me, blue sky dot blueshieldca.com blue sky dot blueshieldca.com so check that out and thanks to blue shield of california for sponsoring um this particular series um also want to thank you for taking some time out to check this video out if you've been intrigued if you want to see the rest of this trauma and healing series come back to the platform brotherbewell.com uh you can check that series out and any one of a number of other great videos awesome audio podcasts fantastic compelling print pieces and all kinds of resources as well right at brotherbewell.com that's brotherbewell.com slash resources where you can go to check all of that out you want to onboard if you can join become a member join the brother be well brotherhood until next time my name again is michael p coleman i'm content director for brother be well and i want to encourage you to do two quick things for me take great care of yourself and everything we're doing is designed to try to help you do that once you get it down pat or at least a little bit reach out help somebody else if you will Thanks a lot and you take care.